Hi, everybody. We're going to get started in just a minute. We're getting everybody logged into the uh, webinar. We got a, a lot of attendance this time, which is really good. Uh, so just be patient and we'll start in just a minute. Uh, if you are having trouble getting logged in, uh, please use the uh, chat box and uh, uh, we'll try to get you some assistance. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Chris Bonamy. I am the Deputy Director for the DuPage County Stormwater Management Department, and we are here for a water quality outreach webinar that will cover wetland and creek restoration project done by the Forest Preserve District with uh, on Springbrook number one within the Blackwell Forest Preserve. Uh, Springbrook number one is a tributary to the west branch of the DuPage River, and elements of the project include a remandering of the creek uh, connecting it to an existing waterway, as well as dam removal, fish habitat improvements, and landscape restoration. Uh, this is a free webinar, and one PDH, one professional development hour, will be available for your participation. Uh, we have several of these workshops throughout the year. We find that these workshops are a great way to connect uh, like-minded organizations and individuals who are interested and concerned with protecting the local uh, water quality of our lakes, rivers, and streams in DuPage County. Uh, these workshops are part of our public outreach and education programs and help us meet requirements outlined in our permit with the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, the webinar is being recorded, so if you're aware of others that couldn't attend uh, this afternoon, uh, we will be sending a link along so that you can share that with them. Uh, and we'll also be sending out a certificate uh, with that PDH, uh, uh, PDH credit. Uh, just a couple thank yous before we, we begin. Uh, first off, thanks to Mary Mitros. Mary is our stormwater communication supervisor and she is running the webinar today. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Conservation Foundation. They are our partners for all of these workshops, uh, specifically Jan Rail. She is the DuPage County Program Director for the foundation and she helped line up our speaker this afternoon. Uh, speaking of our, uh, of our speaker, thank you, Scott Meister from the Forest Preserve for being here and sharing your uh, knowledge and experience with us. Uh, and once again, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us. Um, just a quick note, uh, Thanksgiving is right around the corner. Uh, I love Thanksgiving. It's one of my favorite holidays of the year when our whole family gets together. Uh, even though that can be a little bit crazy and some of those family members can be a little annoying. Uh, but be prepared this year because this year is going to be a little bit different than last year because last year when our family got annoying we could just hit the end meeting button on our zoom call and thanksgiving was over uh, i don't think we're going to be quite so lucky this year uh, but anyway i hope that everyone has a very happy healthy and safe thanksgiving holiday this year uh, before i turn things over to scott i do want to remind everyone that you are muted uh, and so if you do have comments or questions during the presentation, please uh, just type them into the chat box and we will relay those on to Scott at the end of his presentation. And uh, of course, we will get to as many of those as uh, time will allow. Uh, just another little note, uh, please remember that you are in charge of your video cameras. Uh, so you have the power to turn your camera on and off. And if you think that your computer does not have a video camera, um, well, guess what? It probably does. Uh, it probably does. 
Anyway, let me uh, introduce Scott. Scott Meister, or I'm no, sorry, Scott. Yeah, Scott Meister is the manager of natural resources for the Forest Preserve District of DuPage County and has been on staff there at the Forest Preserve since 2002. Scott has a passion for wildlife and began his career as an ecologist. He continues to participate in programs that restore habitat and promote wildlife diversity in DuPage County. Uh, a little bit about his education. He has a bachelor's of science degree in natural resources uh, from the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign and a master of sciences degree in zoology from Southern Illinois University. He is a certified wildlife biologist with the Wildlife Society and has also served as the Wildlife Society's Illinois chapter president. Uh, so very good, all uh, impressive things there. Uh, but right now, Mary, why don't you turn things over to Scott and he can start his presentation. Well, thank you, Chris, for that uh, <clears throat> introduction. Uh, much appreciated. I do have to thank, of course, uh, DuPage County Stormwater Management and the Conservation Foundation for inviting me to uh, speak today. Um, can you see the screen okay, Chris? Yes, we can. Awesome. Um, well, thank you everybody for attending today. I served as a project manager for this project. Um, it's been a big chunk of my work life for the past two years. I'm super excited about it. I'm happy to talk about it for hours, but I really wanna thank all you guys for really listening to me to talk about it. Um, so uh, thank you very much. I'll go ahead and get started with that. Um, I did divide today's presentation into uh, five parts. Um, so I'm gonna first start with talking about the background and the goals of this project, and then move on to um, parts two and three, the pre-construction activities and the engineering, which in, in my opinion can be a little mundane, can be a little boring. This is the office work, the paperwork that needs to get done. But I felt that it was important to include these sections because they are integral if you want to complete a successful project. Crossing your T's and dotting your I's um, in these two steps has to happen. Um, but I promise I won't take too much long on parts two and three because part four, the construction, that's where all the fun begins. That's where I have the good pictures. Uh, that's where I will spend most of today's presentation in part four talking about the construction of this project. And then in the final minutes, I'll talk about what's yet to come, the post-construction activities, the monitoring and performance standards. So with that, let's go ahead and get started on, on the background and goals. So the Forest Preserve District, DuPage County, we were first approached by the tollway, the Illinois tollway many years ago. Um, they had begun to plan a reconstruction of the central tri-state or I-294. They are, many of you I'm sure are aware, are doing construction from Balmoral Avenue near O'Hare all the way down to 95th Street in Oak Lawn. And in many of the uh, areas along the tollway, they're actually widening uh, the roadway. And there are a number of streams that cross underneath the tollway. And um, with their construction, the tollway is actually shading out some of those streams that are flowing underneath 294. And that's a violation of the Clean Water Act. Clean Water Act says you, you can't um, impair a stream in, in that manner. Um, if you can't minimize or avoid those impacts, then you have to mitigate. That means that you have to improve a stream somewhere else to mitigate for those impacts that you're having. So the Illinois Tollway approached the Forest Preserve District and said, hey, DuPage County, do you guys have any uh, streams that could uh, use some work? And we're like, yes, of course, we have miles of streams. Many of them are unfortunately in poor condition. We'd be happy to partner with you on a mitigation project. So that kind of brings us to um, our project today. So here is a, a simple map of DuPage County. Uh, the green polygons on the screen are the Forest Preserve District properties. We, we manage 26,000 acres in public trust uh, for the residents of DuPage County. Uh, there's, we have three major watersheds. So beginning on the left-hand side of the screen, this is the west branch of the DuPage River. This is the east branch of the DuPage River and Salt Creek. So our project today takes place along Springbrook, which is a tributary to the west branch of the DuPage River. And it's in our Blackwell Forest Preserve, kind of in the west central part of the county near Warrenville in West Chicago. So specifically, um, this is our project site and an aerial photo of pre-construction. So if you're familiar with Blackwell Forest Preserve, 
This road on the right-hand side of the screen is Winfield Road. Mack Road is along the top of the screen here. Um, and Springbrook Creek flows from east to west. So it's coming in um, from the east. And you can see that Springbrook, as it flows underneath Winfield Road, it, it's channelized. It's, it's very straight. It's actually um, deeper than you might typically find. And I'll show you a picture of a channelized Springbrook in the, in the next slide. Um, but another feature I wanted to point out that is pretty prominent on the screen, once the stream um, gets out of this channel here, it enters into this bigger area that's really an impoundment. Um, the creek is slowly flowing through here, and it's actually being constricted by a dam. Um, more technically, it might be a weir, um, but for today's presentation, I'm calling it a dam. Um, that's right at this service road. There's a, a serv gravel service road that runs north to south through Blackwell Forest Preserve um, that goes over the dam and a culvert um, that conveys water from the impoundment um, down into the lower reaches of Springbrook where you can see that it's channelized again. Um, another important feature that I wanna point out on this aerial photo is this white line here, which is the regional trail. So a very popular trail that connects the Northern part of DuPage County to the Southern part of DuPage County. Um, so those are some of the features uh, pre, that, that were pre-existing. Uh, here is a picture of Springbrook itself in a very channelized state. Um, <clears throat> The top of the bank is actually here where at the base of this green vegetation, um, what you don't see behind this uh, dead vegetation is the eroded banks. The banks here are very steep. Um, this is because um, water, if it goes in a straight line, can actually move very quickly. Um, when it moves very quickly, it has ero e a lot of erosion potential along the banks. Um, the, the banks will actually slough off, sediment will fall into the stream. Uh, the stream, um, when they're channelized, they're often deeper than they typically might be, which causes them not to um, reconnect to the floodplain. In storm events, what a healthy stream does, it spills out of its banks into the floodplain. It's good from an ecological standpoint. It's even good from a water quality standpoint. So, um, and in this particular picture in the floodplain here, um, this green vegetation is all reed canary grass. It's a, an invasive species that's forming a monoculture and not good at all for uh, wildlife habitat. Um, here's a, a, a short video of the impoundment area. So we are upstream, we are actually flying downstream. So the impoundment, the water that's in there, that's being backed up by this dam, it's actually very, very shallow. Um, there, uh, we know that the water quality in there is very poor, very low dissolved oxygen. Um, this is not good for any of the aquatic or organisms that would use this area. Um, hardly any macroinvertebrates, um, very few freshwater mussels. You can see the vegetation, what is there in this impoundment. It's really all cattails forming a monoculture march, which is really, really not the best um, from a habitat standpoint either. So not very diverse. Um, this impoundment is just full of sediment. And that's something that the dams typically do. They'll, they'll um, back up sediment and disrupt that sediment transport downstream. Um, if I never tried walking in this area, I never encouraged anybody to walk into the, this impoundment because if you do, you would just sink in that sediment and it'd be really tough to, to um, get out. Um, but I stopped the video right here. There's two um, things I want to point out on this current view. And um, one is the dam, which I'll show in the next picture, is actually right here. And as water exits this, uh, goes through the dam, it enters this culvert that is underneath the service road before it continues on down Springbrook, down the channel. Um, in storm events, this culvert was not large enough to convey the water that would swell up in this impoundment. And what we were finding and seeing is that uh, water would spill out over the service road and it would flow to the west. Um, it would find a natural low area that's right over here where the pointer is right now. Um, there was kind of a, a little bit of a channel that carried and conveyed water further downstream um, and re-entered Springbrook downstream. So those are, those are two features I'm going to talk about here in just a second. 
So here's a picture of that dam or that weir. I'm standing on that service road now looking upstream. So the dam was pretty simple, just some concrete slabs that were being uh, held in place with some I-beams. Um, here is uh, the upstream end of that uh, culvert. And so now here's the downstream end of, of the culvert. Here's the service road up top. So you can see that water is coming through that culvert, even in normal flows at a pretty good pace, a pretty good clip. Um, what's most important even about this dam is the change in elevation. In the previous slide, the water elevation at the dam compared to uh, this point down here on the downstream side of the culvert is a change in seven feet in elevation. So water, because of that elevation change, is ripping through here at a pretty good pace. You can imagine that if you were a fish or other organism in, in the water and you wanted to swim upstream, there is no way that a fish can um, make it through not only this current, but then to navigate that seven foot change in elevation in such a short distance. We know that dams are impediments to fish passage, and this was a, a case in point that really illustrated that. Our, our data even, even showed us that. We, we, we knew that. We had done fish surveys upstream of the dam and downstream of the dam. We had documented 17 different species of fish on the downstream side of this dam, while we only found eight species on the upstream side of the dam. So we knew that if we were able to remove uh, the dam at Blackwell here, that there was a potential for a number of fish species to move up into the upper reaches of Springbrook. Um, here's just a picture of uh, flooding of that service road. So here is where the culvert crosses underneath that service road. So you can see how water um, spills out of the impoundment, crosses over the service road, and uh, finds this low spot. You can see in the flooding event just how much gravel is washed away. Um, not only was uh, the road impassable during storm events, but it really was a maintenance nightmare for our staff. Every year we would have gravel that would wash downstream. And we'd have to come back and repair that. So um, it's just a, a maintenance nightmare. Um, and, and this is that regional trail on, on a typical spring day. Um, because that trail um, sat so low, it was really in the floodplain. Um, it constantly held water. You can see the shoulders were wet, the trail was wet, and it really just wasn't a good user experience. Um, in, in rain events, we would have to close part of the trail as well. So just uh, some of the issues that we were trying to uh, correct here uh, prior to the project. So the goals for this project, First and foremost was our regulatory goal. We had to improve the aquatic habitat. We had to make the tollway good um, from, from their construction project and mitigate and improve the aquatic habitat that was here at the site. We had some supplemental goals. In addition to improving the stream and the stream quarter, corridor, we wanted to improve the upland habitat. Um, we wanted to have a, a landscape scale effect. We wanted to restore a bigger portion of Blackwell um, so that we can uh, you know, create an environment conducive for, for fish, wildlife, and plants. We wanted to reduce flooding and the maintenance costs from um, that we saw at the service road and of course improve the user experience. So those were some of our goals going into this project. All right, moving on um, to parts two and three, the pre-construction activity as engineering. And I'll try to go through this as quickly as possible, um, but I wanted to include these because we do have a pretty wide audience listening to the webinar today. And for anybody that's not um, planned a project like this, there is a lot of work that goes into the project pre-construction that helps us build a um, strong project. So first, um, consultations. There's a number of laws that we have to make sure that we're following and that we don't violate. For example, the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, we have to certify that our project is not going to damage or destroy any artifacts. We often consult with the Illinois State Archaeological Survey or even private archaeological company that will have to come to the project site, do what they call a shovel ready test. Um, excuse me, do a shovel test um, and look for artifacts um, to make sure we're not causing any damage to any sort of historic site. 
We have to consult uh, with Fish and Wildlife Service to make sure we're not in violation of the Federal Endangered Species Act. Both the species on the screen um, occur in DuPage County and in the forest preserves. Um, so it's important that our project doesn't destroy habitat for these two species. Um, the Eastern Prairie Fridge Orchid, for example, it only blooms for about three weeks out of the year. So it's important that we do surveys to document that this species is not present at our project site. Um, we have to do those surveys in that three week blooming window. So if you miss that window, you can delay your project by, by a full year. We have to consult with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources um, on a, a lot of different aspects. We have to make sure that we're not impacting any state endangered species like the black crown night heron, which does occur in DuPage County. We have to make sure we're not impacting nature preserves, Illinois natural areas inventory sites, or natural heritage landmarks. Thankfully, the uh, IDNR has what they call the EcoCat tool, which some may be familiar, which allows us to submit our project for review. Um, and um, it reviews our project in context of all of the uh, various aspects uh, of the law that we, we have to make sure we're not uh, violating. There's data collection that has to occur prior to uh, the project. Um, one example is drain tile survey. Uh, you know, most of the land that, not most, but a lot of the land that the Forest Preserve owns was in agricultural production um, prior to the Forest Preserve owning it. So we find uh, agricultural drain tiles all over our properties. Um, and of course, these were installed many years ago. So the tiles themselves are the um, older terracotta clay style, not the corrugated plastic that uh, are used in modern installations. Um, and these terracotta clay tiles, they do fail over time. So it's important for us to know if we have any tiles on our property and where they are so that we can plan properly, um, create wetlands, um, et cetera. Um, so just for example, um, this is our project site and the results of the drain tile survey. We did find one drain tile here in the red line um, that you see on the screen. So this is going to help us when we begin to plan out how we want to restore this creek, how we can use uh, that and incorporate the, the drain tiles in this area that wants to be wet um, into our project. We have to do a wetland de delineation where staff will go out and uh, determine where wetlands are. They look at the, the vegetation on the site, uh, the soils, the hydrology, um, and the results of wetland delineations uh, are these the maps like you see on the screen here that show you where all the, the wetlands are. In, in this case, they're in the, the shaded in green. Um, so this helps us to avoid impacts or if we ha uh, have impacts to our own wetlands, we of course have to uh, mitigate for those too. Um, another a piece of information that we collect prior to a project is soil borings. We kind of had a, an inkling that we knew we were going to install a couple bridges with this project. Um, so soil borings, they essentially take a profile of the soil. This is just kind of a fancy map that results from that data collection that shows us, well, we know we have, you know, an inch or two of topsoil, and then we have, um, you know, a foot or two of sand and gravel, and it gives us a soil profile. And the engineers are able to use this to determine whether or not um, a bridge is suitable in that area or what type of bridge and the load that is suitable for, for the soils that are present there. So once we have all this background information, we can also begin designing the project. Um, before I get too um, deep into this, I do want to give um, spend a minute on uh, stream ecology. You can take whole college courses on stream ecology and stream morphology. So I'm going to try to summarize a, a key point here in uh, a few seconds. So um, streams want to meander naturally. They are not straight um, in nature. Um, they, they have a rhythm to it. And as water moves through a meandering stream, on the outside bends, water is actually going to move uh, more quickly um, because it has a greater distance to cover than the water that's on the inside of the bend. And when water moves more quickly, um, it's going to have more erosion potential. And so you often see some, some scouring on the outside bends, um, some soil that is going to slough off and be carried with the water. And as water moves downstream and transports this sediment, um, on the inside of the bends, again, 
it, water moves slowly. So that soil and sediment that's being transported will often fall out, it will often settle. And we see on the inside of bends more shallow areas, um, areas that we call point bars. Uh, another analogy uh, to how water moves through stream is like a downhill skier um, doing slaloms. Um, as you see a skier going downstream, when they want to make a sharp turn, they dig their outside ski down to make that turn. When they dig that ski down, you often see snow fly up um, because it's the ski is digging deep. Same thing with water. When water wants to make a, a sharp turn, on, they dig down on the, the water digs down on the outside and actually creates a pool, a deeper area on the outside of our bends. Um, another important feature are, are, are riffles. I'm going to talk a lot about riffles here in a few minutes, but riffles are these shallower areas that are in between the pools. When looking at uh, a stream profile in um, profile view, you can see uh, kind of it's kind of like these steps. You have a riffle, then a pool, and this deeper area, a shallow riffle, a deeper pool, and so on and so forth. If you really get into um, stream morphology, there's a couple of other uh, features in streams like uh, runs and glides, but I'm not going to get into those for today's discussion. So that's a real brief uh, intro to, to stream morphology and, and things we look at when we're designing a new stream. Um, our engineers will also uh, do quite a bit of hydraulic modeling. So this is just a simple um, schematic showing um, how water would react pre-construction in a two-year event, a 10-year event, a 100-year event, where water wants to go. Engineers will often then take a fi the final design and do hy more hydraulic modeling to show how the water flow and water conveyance has changed over time. Um, it's important that we don't change the floodplain. If our project does change the floodplain, we have to consult with FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, um, who of course puts out floodway maps and, and it's important that they know how we're changing uh, the environment. So uh, when designing a stream, we're often asked, well, are you going to put the stream back in its original course? And the answer is, no, not always. Uh, many times we don't know what the original course was. This is an aerial photo of our project site from 1939. So you can see even then Springbrook was channelized. Um, the farmers, you know, would install their drain tiles and send water to uh, the creek or a ditch as quickly as possible and want to convey water as fast as they could off their land. Um, we're not even sure that Springbrook was an actual creek prior to settlement. It may have been just a, a low-lying area or kind of a, a low drainage that flowed intermittently during storm events. Um, and with the advent of development, more and more water had gotten sent to uh, that the stream or the creek. And it, you know, now it's probably conveying more water than it ever did prehistoric or uh, pre-settlement. Um, when we're designing a stream, it's important to look at today's situation. For example, we know DuPage County is for the most part built out. There's a lot of impervious surface in the county. There's a lot of storm flow that goes to our creeks. There's a number of wastewater treatment facilities that release effluent into the, into the streams. Springbrook is uh, a good example of that. Most of the flow in Springbrook today comes from effluent from the Wheaton Sanitary District. So when we're looking at redesigning a stream and improving it, we have to make sure we take into consideration today's conditions. Um, so again, here's the aerial photo I showed earlier today. Um, after all this data collection and consulting with engineers, we come up with a design. So this is our new design and how we want to improve Springbrook. Essentially, we're going to reroute the channel um, in many different locations. Uh, there's a few things I want to point out here. Um, we would divide our project into um, three reaches. I'll often call them thirds, even though they're not technically thirds. Um, but here in this upper reach, you can see we have this um, typical meandering pattern, uh, like I showed in that example diagram a couple of slides ago, where we're hoping to uh, mimic natural stream function. Um, however, once we get into this area that is the impoundment, um, the meanders are less severe. And our goals in this center reach are less about 
habitat improvement and water quality, and more about stability. We know that in that impoundment, behind that dam, there's a lot of sediment. We know that it's deep. And our concern here is mobilizing that sediment. We don't want any of that sediment to go downstream. And so you don't see the sharp meanders in the center part of our project like we do in the other two projects, in the other two thirds of the project. Um, again, the goal here is stabilization. You can see we're going to reroute the stream moving downstream. Um, we're going to take advantage of that natural low area that I showed um, in the drone video of our impoundment. We're going to send the water in that low area because we know that's where it wants to go. Um, and then as we move further downstream, we resume that typical meandering pattern that's uh, typical of streams um, that we know is good and healthy for that. The other feature that uh, is evident on the screen, we're going to reroute that regional trail to higher and drier ground and get it out of the floodplain. So this project, it, it's, it's a construction project. We have uh, worked with our engineers to develop a construction plan set that has typical sections, much like uh, many other construction type projects. You can see the like a grading plan that shows just how we're going to construct the stream, where all the boulders and rock material that we're going to use, where we're going to put the wetlands, how the wetlands are going to connect to the new stream. Um, where the trail is going to go, where the bridge is going to go. We develop a schedule of unit prices. We put it out to bid. We hire a contract. We get a permit from the county and the Corps. And hallelujah, it's time for construction. Let the fun begin. Do all that legwork for literally years. Um, and it's time to begin the project. So we had uh, executed a contract in spring of 2019, we were getting ready to cons begin construction on the project. And uh, it, then May 2019 began. If you remember in May, we had record May rainfalls and the, the site was pretty wet as you can imagine along the creek. So we had to wait for the site to dry out. And it really wasn't until July 4th that we began to construct the project. So we began at the downstream end of our project. There, was, there were some trees that needed to be removed as part of the project, cottonwoods primarily, but we were able to use these in a creative way that I'll show you in a couple of slides. So we began digging the, the new stream channel. <clears throat> this is a pretty typical um, pool that we began to dig. The water that you see here is seeping in. It's groundwater. Um, and so our contractors would have to have a pump uh, pumping the water out of uh, the, the construction area down into the actual stream that's still flowing. Um, this is one technique that we use on the project that we call a soil lift or burrito wrap. And this area is really going to be the top of the bank on the inside of a bend. Um, these card, these, excuse me, these wooden boards here are just temporary to help with construction. Um, but when we're constructing a new stream, um, we always have to be aware of the erosion potential. And the best way to protect against erosion is really plant material. You want plants growing on the site and have their root system stabilize the soil. But when a, in a new project, you can't always, uh, it, it takes time for plants to establish and uh, set those good root systems. And so another technique to help stabilize a project and prevent erosion is through armoring. And so these soil lifts and, and burrito wraps um, just add some protection um, to those erosive forces. So here's a, a picture of the same bend after it's been completed. So here's that uh, soil lift or burrito wrap that offers some protection. Um, we add cobble and gravel to the inside bend, the point bar, the shallower areas. Um, and um, even on the outside bend of the pool, uh, we have erosion control blanking and then another of these soil lifts um, that's encased in burlap just to help um, protect the stream banks. Um, a couple slides ago, I showed you some of the cottonwoods that we had to take down. Um, we were able to salvage the about 10 feet of the trunk along with the root wad. Um, and we use these as armament on the outside bends. We would actually turn the, the root wad, so here's the root wad and, and the trunk, turn it on its side and push it into the outside of what it will become the new, the new stream bends. So here's the, another pool that's deeper 
that rises up to a shallow area to the point bar, but you can see the series of root wads that were installed all on the outside of the bank. Um, this is good from a couple standpoints. Um, one, because it is just added protection. Um, two, there's lots of crevices and cracks and holes where smaller fish can actually find refuge from predators and bigger fish. Um, and, and more importantly, by uh, woody material is actually a very natural and needed component in streams. Um, we don't have a lot of natural woody components in um, newly constructed streams. There's a lot of organisms, including macroinvertebrates, uh, that like to feed on that woody material. And so by incorporating um, some woody structure into a new stream or wetland, you're actually promoting wildlife and invertebrate habitat. Another prominent feature or technique that we use in stream restoration uh, is a riffle or riffle sills. So again, riffles are those shallow areas of, of the stream that are in between the deeper pools. So this is the construction of what we call the sill. The sill is just the row of boulders that's going to sit at the bottom of the stream channel um, in the center. These boulders are gonna be underwater during normal flow. And as you come up the banks, uh, they'll slowly emerge out of the water. Um, and, and these sills provide a, a couple of, of benefits. Um, one, they allow the water to kind of babble over the rocks. Um, and when that happens, water is incorporated into, or excuse me, oxygen is incorporated into the water. So that's good for fish and mussels and macroinvertebrates. Um, but these sills also are set at a very specific elevation. Um, they um, prevent erosion from occurring. One type of um, erosion is what we call head cutting, uh, where um, a stream will erode downstream and move upstream. And by setting these big boulders, they're not going to be moving any, anytime soon. Um, so they can arrest certain uh, types of erosion. Um, sorry, getting back to what I said earlier, that these sills are set at a very specific elevation. Um, in the course of this project, there are 14 sills that are uh, installed in our project. Oh, I'm sorry, here's just one more picture of, of kind of what uh, uh, a sill looks at a more finished um, standpoint. Here's the row of boulders. And you can see um, some of these are, are really buried after we bring in some uh, more of the cobble that's going to be the bottom of our stream bed. And as we go up the banks, they, they rise further. Um, but there are 14 of these riffles that are placed at locations that you're seen as the red points on this map. And each riffle sill is set at an elevation that is six inches different from the next sill. And so there's 14 of them. And if you remember earlier, the pre-construction conditions at the dam, there was a change in elevation that was seven foot over a very short distance. And by using these 14 sills, we've essentially set the stream elevation to um, rise at seven feet over the course of the entire project. So six inch difference from this ripple to this one, six inch from this one to that one, and so on and so forth. And essentially what we've done is created a fish ladder. It's a way for fish to move upstream easily um, over a long distance and not have to navigate changes in elevation that are, that are too great to overcome. So by August of 2019, we had finished constructing the downstream third of the project. Um, this is what it looks like. So here's one of those riffles. Here's a pool with the root wads on the outside bend. Here's a riffle, pool, riffle, pool, riffle, pool, um, just like a, a natural stream would, stream would uh, you would see. Uh, another thing to point out here is the rough grading for the new regional trail that's on higher and drier ground. Um, all the water that you see in this picture is groundwater fed from when the pumps are torn, uh, turned off. Um, the creek in this picture is still flowing um, right behind this orange construction fencing that you see or maybe you can see. Um, so turned out great. It's now time to move upstream into the impoundment area, into the center third. So um, 
we began to dismantle the dam in summer 2019 to allow that impoundment to slowly dewater, slowly let the water out. Um, we had a number of erosion control measures that were um, placed downstream because we knew that um, there is sediment in the water behind the dam. We knew that some sediment would be released, but it was important that we capture that sediment before it left our project site. Um, despite having these measures in place, um, we were noticing immediately that sediment was still escaping from our project site. There was so much sediment behind the dam and it was so fine that it was um, being held in the water column. It was not settling out. Um, and because we were seeing the water leave our site, we had to reassemble the dam. Thankfully, we were able to put it back together pretty easily and come up with a new plan. Um, sending sediment downstream off your project, it's a, it's a violation. Um, you, you cannot do that by the Clean Water Act. Um, so we ended up working with our engineers and our contractors and developing a new method to dewater our impoundment. Essentially, what we decided to do was build a brand new bypass channel so the area you see in red um, was the proposed site of a new temporary channel, a channel that one would, as water would convey from down Springbrook, it would, uh, before it gets to the impoundment, it would flow through the new channel and completely, and enter this new, the stream um, right where the existing dam was, completely bypassing the impoundment area so that no water would be flowing through that impoundment and the impoundment can dry out naturally. So this was a change in our original plan. Um, it was not part of our original permit. So this uh, new feature we had to send back to the Army Corps of Engineers, back to DuPage County uh, to, for permit review um, so they can approve it, make sure we were doing everything correctly um, and not in a harmful or impactful way. Um, that does take some time. So for much of the fall of 2019, there was not much activity at the construction site. However, um, in the wintertime, our bridge subcontractor were able to begin work on the two bridges. Um, the one bridge was a uh, prefab, or excuse me, was a concrete beams, fabricated from concrete beam, beams. Uh, the other bridge was a prefabricated pedestrian bridge that came in two parts that were uh, bolted together in the center and lifted and set in place. Um, and for the interest of today's uh, presentation, uh, that's really all I'm going to uh, say about the bridges. Um, but they were installed uh, during that winter. Um, also in December of 2019, um, we, after a couple months, we did get approval from the Corps and DuPage County to move forward with our alternative plan of constructing the bypass channel. So our contractors began constructing that channel in um, December 2019. So here's the impoundment on the left-hand side of the screen. The dam is just here off the screen to the left. Um, they began excavating that new channel, lining it with fabric. And it took them about a month to um, construct this um, and then divert water into this bypass channel so the impoundment can dry out. Um, if you remember the winter of 2019, 2020, um, we didn't really have frozen ground conditions. And so uh, our contractors, once they completed this bypass channel, decided to, well, let's go ahead and construct this third of the project um, while we were waiting for the impoundment to dry out. So here we are in January of 2020, doing pretty much the same thing we did on the downstream third of the project. Here's a deeper pool, shallow point bar area. Um, we armor it with uh, soil lifts, um, rock and cobble, um, erosion control blanking, blanket. Um, and again, all the water that you see here is, is groundwater um, that has seeped in. So I am going to jump ahead real quick. Um, I do want to show you this uh, aerial photo from uh, the summer of 2020, which kind of demonstrates how we were able to construct this channel in what we call in the dry. Um, the creek is always flowing. Um, this is the, the existing or old channel uh, before it enters that bypass channel. And um, here's what we were able to construct. Once we're done constructing the entire new channel, the last piece is to pull, pull the plug. We'll excavate this last piece of land that is separating the old channel from the new channel. Um, I'll show you this in a few slides. Um, so for reference, here's a, this white fence here in the background. So um, spring 2020, our plants, our plugs began arriving on site. The areas that were constructed in 2019 were all planted in 2020. 
Um, by June of 2020, the impoundment was uh, didn't, has not been receiving any water, uh, any flows, I should say, uh, for about six months now. May 2020 was also uh, a record year for rains, if you remember. Um, so you can see this impoundment even though it wasn't receiving flowing water, was still pretty wet and soft. And it wasn't until July of 2020 again that we'd be able to begin construction on this last third of the project in the impoundment. So this is what the impoundment actually looked like just one month later. You see the vegetation had begun to grow. It's mostly annual weeds. Um, but we began to excavate this new channel in the impoundment. And it became very clear and very obvious to us how deep the sediment actually was. It was 10 to 15 feet in some locations. You can't drive equipment on the soft sediment. You would sink. It was, um, we had to quickly think on our feet. Um, our contractor was V3. They came up with a great plan, which essentially called for us over excavating the area, um, excavating more of the impoundment that we needed to for the actual stream construction. Once we would excavate a wide area, we would bring in what I'm going to call structural clay, this browner material that you see on the screen. We would um, dump this material. We would compact it enough that we can drive equipment onto it. Um, the excavator can then drive onto this structural clay, reach out, excavate upstream, we move the sediment off site, we would bring more structural clay into the area that was just excavated. The excavator would then sit on that new area, reach further and excavate and so on and so forth until we moved upstream up the entire length of the impoundment. So essentially what we ended up doing then was building a kind of a road, for lack of a better word, that allowed us to drive the equipment on and excavate the new channel. So here's just another progression. Once we had the bigger footprint all excavated, we can begin forming that new stream channel. So the cobble and gravel that formed the bottom of the stream bed is here in the center of the picture. We um, had topsoil uh, that uh, we used to fill in the over excavated areas. So now you can see the stream beginning to take shape even more in the center area. Um, again, because our goal here was stabilization, uh, we ended up lining the banks of the center reach um, with cobble just to prevent the stream from really wanting to go where it wanted to um, and, and preventing that erosion from occurring. Um, so finally, by August of 2020, the entire new channel had been excavated and constructed, and it was time to turn, turn the water on. So this area is that plug that I showed a few slides back. It was the last step to excavate this area and divert flow into that new channel. So there's that white fence for reference. So by August, 2020, we now have water flowing into our new channel. I can't say enough about how impressed I am with how the vegetation had responded and grown. The plants that were planted in the spring of 2020 just grew wonderfully uh, during the summer months. Black-eyed Susan, uh, excuse me, Arrowhead, the rushes along the side of the banks here. Cardinal flower was blooming in its first year after planting. Uh, the native hibiscus or rose mallow, this would come up from seed. This was inside one of those soil lifts uh, and it was already blooming in its first year. So I'm super happy with how the vegetation began to grow. Now, also in the summer of 2020, um, after we diverted water into the new channel, the footprint of the, oh, oh I'm sorry, one more slide, um, just showing before and after, or just one year progression of here's one of our riffle sills um, here at the riffles. And this is the same area one year later, just demonstrating how well the vegetation took place. Um, you can see here the, the boulders that are across the stream are actually, you can't see them, water's flowing over them, incorporating that oxygen into the water. But after we diverted water into the new stream, um, the old channel was still physically there. And downstream of the old dam, we knew we had good fish population. We knew we had freshwater mussels. So we spent time um, rescuing and salvaging the fish and mussels that were in the old creek channel. So we ended up finding 386 individual freshwater mussels of five different species that we located, relocated upstream. We conducted fish surveys using the backpack shocker um, to relocate 
the fish that we found there. We found over 1,100 fish of 22 species that we then released into the new stream channel. Um, and then finally, the, one of the last parts of this project was to build that regional trail. So by fall of 2020, this is what the, the site had looked like. There's the new regional trail, um, some of our wetlands. I forgot to mention, we did create 22 new acres of wetlands uh, with this project. So this was the area right through here where that drain tile was located that we disrupted and created wetlands out of. Um, and you can just see the downstream part as we move upstream. So I'm really happy with uh, how, how the project turned out. Um, you may mention earlier, one of the goals was to increase the up, uh, improve the upland habitat. And so finally, this past winter, we did have frozen ground conditions that allowed our contractor to remove all the invasive uh, brush, primarily honeysuckle and buckthorn from the upland areas. About 62 acres of upland habitat was restored as part of the process. In the spring of this past year, more plugs showed up. In total, we had about 100,000 plugs planted on our project site. Carolyn from V3 and her crew did an awesome job just sorting and planting um, the hundreds of thousands of plugs. Here you can see them planting in a, in a more emergent area. This is uh, in another wetland that was more of a wet prairie after planting the plugs. And again, I'm just impressed with how the vegetation um, took off. This was an area that was planted in 2020. The blue flag was blooming in its first year. The pickerel weed did an awesome job. Um, just completely impressed. So I know I only have a few minutes left. Um, so I'm going to kind of conclude today's pre presentation with uh, part five, the monitoring and performance standards. Now that the project is all done in construction, um, we, of course, we can't just walk away. We're required by our two permits to maintain the site for uh, five years and to make sure that it stays and remains in a high quality setting. So before we I talk about the formal monitoring, I wanted to talk about some of the anecdotal monitoring, the observations that I've had just over this past year, because I'm, I'm actually getting really excited about dragonflies and damselflies and learning more about them. Just the diversity that I've seen on the project site this past year was incredible. Blue dashers. Um, in addition to the dragonflies and damselflies, great egrets, great blue herons, kingfishers are all hunting the new creek. Spotted sandpipers were one of the first birds to colonize our new stream. While I didn't confirm it, I'm pretty sure they did nest there. Uh, widow skimmers, eastern forktails, pearl crescent butterflies, American ruby spots, just some examples of uh, the diversity that's already using our newly constructed channel. Um, we will, because we haven't had any formal monitoring on uh, the dragonflies yet, we will be establishing a volunteer monitoring route for 2022 to better quantify uh, the species that, that are there. Um, in terms of the formal monitoring, there's a lot of uh, structural or geomorphological aspects that have to be monitored. We have to monitor those riffles those sills, we got to make sure they don't move. We have to measure the geometry of, of the stream to make sure it doesn't change. We have to do some pebble counts, um, vegetation sampling, um, wetlands and waters delineation, um, as you can see. So we're going to be on the site for, for at least five years uh, monitoring the project. And one last thing, my last final point of today's presentation. I want to go back to this slide. This is the, the three major rivers or creeks in DuPage County. And I think some of the success that we are seeing at Springbrook phase two project in terms of the biologicals responding quickly, seeing the great good fish populations, the good dragonfly and damsel popu populations, I think it speaks to a lot of the good work that has already been done in our watersheds. 15 years ago, we restored eight miles of the West Branch of the DuPage River and Crest Creek as part of a Superfund remediation project. Shortly thereafter, we restored part of Springbrook number two down in Naperville, Springbrook Prairie. We restored a mile long stretch of the West Branch at our West Branch Forest Preserve near Bartlett. We restored part of Salt Creek in Oak Meadows. In 2015, we restored uh, the upper reaches of Springbrook at our St. James Farm, and then this project. And you can see we're beginning to connect these restored stretches of creeks and rivers. And I truly believe that this is a case where 
the sum is greater than the individual parts. And we're seeing synergistic effects. We're, we're building good populations of fish and mussels and invertebrates on our river systems so that when we do restore the tributaries, um, they can immediately colonize and thrive. And so I, 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 really, I really think that is what's happening here. Um, as I conclude, I absolutely have to thank uh, partners, especially the Illinois Tollway that provided funding for this project. I have to thank um, our engineer, WBK, um, our contractor, V3, did a wonderful job, and uh, of course, the many other partners, um, including Stormwater Management, Conservation Foundation, DuPage River Salt Creek Port Group. So thank you very much for listening to me speak. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that uh, you guys may have. Thank you. All right, great. Hey, thank you, Scott. That was very... Uh... A very good presentation. Great job. Uh, things look really good out there. I'm very impressed. Uh, very nice. We, we do have some questions that have kind of rolled in here. So let me read a couple of these off to you. Um, first off, oops, where did my... I just... Oh, here it is. I'm sorry. Um, let's see. Uh, does the project provide any flood storage benefit for up or downstream areas? upstream or downstream areas? It, it's marginal. Uh, you know, we never uh, really marketed this area, uh, this project as a, a flood control project. It was mostly about um, water quality and habitat. Right, okay. Uh, a couple of these questions I know you, you, you talked about with the um, uh, restocking the mussels in there and some of the, the native fish uh, were replaced from the old channel to the new channel. Um, but here's a question. Did the natural channel in the impoundment after dewatering generally match the location of the proposed new channel? Um, yes and no. In some spots it, it did. Um, in other spots it, it didn't. Um, it was, we didn't, really didn't know prior to the project where that natural channel was going to form in the impoundment. So it was a little bit difficult for us to um, try to guess where that was going to be. Um, also, because of our original plan for dewatering that area, we had kind of pushed the channel to the um, northwest part of the impoundment um, because our original plan was to um, maintain flow in the south east part of the impoundment. Um, so we couldn't really follow the natural channel down the center if we wanted to. Um, so kind of yes and no. Um, and Chris, before you go on to the next question, uh, let me back up to the previous question too about flood storage. Um, with the new construction, um, it was our goal to connect the stream to the floodplain more so than it was before. Um, the wetlands are connected to the stream. And so what we see during storm events as water comes up into the, uh, as water rises in the new stream channel, it does flow and spill out into the wetlands. Um, and as the wetlands will eventually fill up and they will provide some sort of storage capacity. And as the creek, uh, lowers, then the wetlands will empty back into the creek. So again, we didn't really, um, wasn't the main aspect of the project to provide flood storage or flood control, but it certainly does. Yeah. All right, very good. Um, here's another question uh, related to maybe some costs. How much uh, did this project cost and what were the overruns due to these sediment problems? Sure. So when it's all said and done, um, we're talking a project that's over $9 million. Um, we spent over $100,000 in, in, or excuse me, we spent nearly a million million dollars in plugs in vegetating the site. Um, so it was a nearly $9 million project that includes all the engineering, all the permits, um, the monitoring and reporting after the project. Um, so it was a pretty, pretty significant number. Um, in terms of cost overruns for the sediment, um, the original plan that uh, we were going to use to dewater the impoundment was uh, pretty expensive in terms of, we were, I didn't get into it, but we were going to build a coffer dam down the center of the impoundment. So our, our contractor V3 essentially told us they were able to build that bypass channel for the same price that they were going to um, build the coffer dam. So that didn't cost us any, any more um, money at all. Um, there was a, a slight uh, overrun um, when we had to over excavate the, the 
channel in the impoundment and bring in some of that structural clay. Um, there was a, a few hundred thousand dollars uh, that we weren't expecting in costs, but um, we were able to make up for that in other ways. All right, very good. Um, there was another question. Uh, again, it was talking about flood storage. I think you kind of covered that already. Uh, and I don't see any other questions. I, I had one quick question. You know, the, the original dam, what, what was that original dam used for? And why was it out there, you know? No, we, we've been asked that question. We tried to do our research on it. Um, I, I don't exactly know why that dam was ever constructed. I, we don't even know how old it, it is officially. Um, it, it's kind of perplexing to us. Um, we don't know much history about the impoundment itself. You know, just if you're familiar with Blackwell, just next door is Silver Lake, which we know was a quarry operation. Um, we speculate that the area that was the impoundment may have also been a quarry at some point. They may have done some digging in there to try to get the sand and gravel that's abundant on the site. That may have helped uh, lead to the deep sediments that we found. Um, but in the end, we honestly, we just, we just don't know. Okay. Uh, very good. I, I see uh, one last question that just rolled in. Uh, how did you prevent sediment from traveling downstream when you pulled the plug on that last remaining portion uh, of ground to connect the uh, completed portions of the project? Sure. Um, you know, when you're doing some earth moving work where there's flowing water, there's always that potential for um, some sediment moving downstream. Um, by permit, we can't allow the sediment to move off site. Um, so we, by having a project that is almost a mile long, um, the little bit of sediment that was disturbed when we pulled the plug settled out into the sections of our new channel before it got off site. Um, so in addition, we, I think we did have some, um, like a silt fence or a, like a flocculent and a silt fence across the stream to help um, trap any of that sediment. So there are a couple of mechanical measures that we took uh, that, that we used, but also um, by having that length of stream, um, there was no sediment that moved off site. All right. Hey, Scott, thank you very much. Great job. Uh, the, the site looks great. I can't wait. I ride my bike through there sometimes. I can't wait to go check it out again. Um, and uh, I'll probably have to wait till the spring. But anyway, great presentation. Great job answering the questions. And uh, thanks for being here with us and sharing your knowledge and experience with us. So thank you. Thank you guys for having me. I truly appreciate it. If anyone else yeah. has questions, you know, please contact me. Very good. Uh, uh, yeah, get a hold of Scott if you have any other questions. Uh, again, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. We hope you've learned a few things from this webinar this afternoon. Uh, please remember, Mary will email everyone with a link to the presentation, uh, a recording of the webinar, and that PDH certificate. Uh, we do have a, a, a future webinar scheduled for December 9th, uh, so we hope to see you there. Uh, and until that time, uh, have a great day and thank you very much.